All right, everybody, it's that time again. It's Big Daddy and Friends. And I'll tell you, I'm uh, stepping out of my lane here with this next guest because he's big time. I mean, he is, you know, he's on NBC. He's on uh, the number one show, The Blacklist, and he's just a badass. So uh, without further ado, I want to welcome my man, Hisham Tafik. What's up, brother? How are you doing, sir? Thank you for having me. I might change my name to Big Time to match Big Daddy. Exactly. You should. You should. <laughs> you should. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's funny how life works. You know, you meet people and you, and uh, for me, I'm very fortunate that when I meet people, I'm able to develop a relationship and, and it just clicked, you know, and I think okay. when we were introduced, it was just kind of like, you know, boom, I'm like, wow, man, you know, and the first time we spoke on the phone, I know you got a chuckle out of me saying, wow, you know, look at this celebrity. He's calling me. I'm like, wow, man, this is big time. So that's why you're big time. So, uh, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> so, so anyway, so listen, uh, the, the first thing that our listeners and viewers probably, you know, just to give a little bit of uh, background and history, you're, you're, uh, you're from New York originally, or, you know, because I know I've yeah. been to your home, so. Uh... Yeah, I'm born and raised in New York, Harlem specifically, um, and spent uh, uh, all of my life uh, uh, there. I never bounce around, but Harlem mm -hmm. is home. That's where I was born. And then, do, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but before you stepped onto the, the Hollywood limelight, you know, you were a fireman, and... For me to find that out, it was funny. Before we had met, I did some research, but before I even started that, uh, someone said to me, hey, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm reading up on this actor. Oh, yeah, he used to be a fireman. And I'm like, what? You know, and then I kind of, it was intriguing to learn that about you because, you know, that's a first responder. You know, you save lives, you put out fires and, Talk about that. Like, what led you into that? Wow. What led me into the fire department? That's a great question because I think most people think that, well, a lot. actually a lot of the people I've met in the fire department had dreams of being a firefighter. They hear these stories of kids who are attracted and in awe of the fire truck and the sirens and the alarms, and they want to be firefighters from early age as a kid. Um for me, that story is different. You know, I grew up in Harlem, definitely seeing a lot of fires in the 70s and the 80s. Yeah. Um, I remember <laughs> right across the street from my building, there were buildings that would have fires at least weekly. Um, so I was no stranger to seeing firefighters work and seeing buildings on fire, but I never wanted to be a firefighter as a kid. Uh, as a kid, I wanted to be in the NFL. I wanted to be a football player. Um, and in high school, when I got introduced to football, I was like, I'm going to college, I'm going to be in the NFL. Uh, I was in love. My first football team was, was the Dan Marino and the Miami Dolphins. My first Super Bowl was watching Doug Williams with the Redskins come from behind. Um, and then that transitioned and I became a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. So my dreams of going to the NFL got shattered early when I was uh, – in high school, I broke my ribs, collapsed lung, broke my thumb, just had too many injuries. And then also my father passed away my senior year in high school. So I kind of lost the drive to go to school or go to college. or I just messed up too much in my senior year. So I think I had an offer to Hampton and uh, Cornell, but I had to go to sub school. And, you know, me with no parents at the time, you know, my mother passed away when I was four. And just losing my father, I was like, I'm not going to summer school. That's out. <laughs> so <laughs> one, of the, one of the things I did do is after my, my I broke my ribs, I uh, as a dare, um, I remember in my high school, there was a poster, I believe, of Herschel Walker. Uh, 
in dance tights and he was doing ballet ballet and i was like wow a football player doing ballet if he can do dance i'm going to try dance so i tried dance at my high school there's a a dance company called repertory dance company of east harlem i joined that dance company and the rest of my senior year i I did dance i did modern hip-hop african and when i graduated high school it was like do i go to summer school or my dance company was going to france and i was like i'm going to france so uh, my football career ended. I went to France and continued to, to dance professionally. Um, and then I found myself at a roadblock. So um, I joined the Marine Corps. Um, and when I came home from the Marine Corps and kind of got my life in order, I remember I had a list on a book in my room. I was like, I'm taking a police department test, taking sanitation tests, taking correction tests. I'm going to enroll in college. I'm going to get my do all of these things. And when I came home, I did it. I took the, the, the Port Authority police test. I took corrections um, and correction department called me first. But at the same time I took the test, I came home one day and there was a flyer on my windowsill that my brother who was at Julia Richmond High School brought home from, I guess, a career day. And on the flyer, it said, hey, Vulcan Society, do you want to be a firefighter? And I was like, holy snap. I never thought about being a firefighter, but all of my previous jobs, the Marine Corps, Boy Scout, I was a lifeguard when I was a Boy Scout. I loved doing things to get my adrenaline pumping and hearing bells. And I was like, wow, the fire department, I never thought about that. Let me sign up for that too. I signed up for the fire department later And thank God, because I I hated corrections. I was working at a place called Sing Sing, which unfortunately, which was the largest maxi max in the country. But also, all of the guys from my block in my neighborhood in Harlem (laughs) happened to be locked up there. So it created an interesting dynamic. And uh, I'll never forget, I got the letter from the fire department saying, hey, February 4th, 1996 is the day you swear in. And that was my last day as a correction officer. I think, I, you know, at that time I was living paycheck to paycheck, but I, I ran away from corrections. I think I went about six weeks without a paycheck. But uh, went into the fire department, and, and that's the short, long story about how that happened. Wow, that's some uh, transformation there. You know, it's uh, you go from A to B to C to D, and all of a sudden, boom, you're at Z, you know? So... <laughs> But then, you know, yeah. <laughs> and it's kind of funny when you, you know, you mentioned that, hey, you're in a correctional center working and uh, a lot of your boys and friends are there. So it's I can't imagine what that was like. But, uh, you know, off to bigger and better things and uh, saving lives and putting out fires. Right. Yeah. Basically, you know, uh, and, and I got to work in Harlem, too. So that was a yeah. blessing. So then, take take us to the next step. What leads you into acting? Well, during that whole time, uh, even when I left high school and joined the dance company, even through the Marine Corps, even through corrections, um, what I continued to do was dance. So I was in my dance company throughout those years. And I just one day said, hey, uh, actually one of the dance companies I was in, they did a play um, where there was a mixture of theater and dance. And it was uh, about this African warrior, Shaka Zulu. Um, I fell in love with the being on stage and doing a little bit of acting with the dancing. So I was like, hey, you know what? Let me give this acting thing a try. So I went and signed up and took a intensive acting workshop at this theater place called uh, NEC, which was uh, Negro Ensemble Theater Company. And that's where all of the legends, that's where Denzel went, Sam Jackson, Debbie Allen, like uh, um, Charles Dutton. And that's where all of these great actors went. So I started up there. I took an intensive workshop. Denzel came to the, Denzel Washington came to the graduation. And from there, I I remember I was at a crossroad and I took an intensive workshop with uh, this woman, Tasha Smith, and she had invited Charles Dutton, who was the natural called The Rock. Um, Yeah. Yeah. No, his nickname was The Rock, I believe. Um, And 
I remember asking Charles Dutton out the acting class because he was someone who had ended up in jail, but then he ended up going to Yale where he studied acting. And I remember asking Charles Dutton, I said, hey, man, you know, what do you recommend? Like, I'm a firefighter, you know, I have a job, I have a son, I have a mortgage, but I'm really serious about this acting thing, but I don't think I can, like, go to college and walk away from all of these responsibilities. And his response was, hey, I'm not going to lie to you, the best thing to do is to go to college where 24 hours of the day, seven days a week, for four years, all you're doing is acting. You're immersed in it, you're living in it and breathing. He's like, you can't replace that. But he said, what you can do is take every acting class you can on your off time, on your spare time. Look for classes, look for workshops. Um, and if that's what you have to do, then that's your life journey. So I removed the guilt of not going to college and going the traditional route to get my acting degree. And I just started taking every night class I could take, day class. Every time I was off from the firehouse, I was in an acting class. And I continued to do that and grow and grow. And it got to a point where I started to do theater. Um, and then I started to do TV and film. And the projects kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh at the 17th year in the fire department, um, that's when I booked Blacklist. But I was older and wiser, and I knew that just because I was on a TV show, um, I knew that it can end at any day. And my mm -hmm. goal was yeah. to work 20 years in the fire department, get my pension, and then move on to my acting career. And it worked out that way, which was truly, truly a blessing. I remember at the crossroads when I hit 20 years, struggling blacklist. I was doing blacklist during the week. I was doing about 24 to 48 hours in the firehouse on the weekend. And then I was like, oh my God, I'm scared to walk away from this job. All my life, I never had parents that gave me money. I was the oldest of five brothers and I had gotten a paycheck every day of my life. Um, so the idea of leaving that guaranteed paycheck and going into TV and film, which yes, it's a bigger paycheck, but it's not guaranteed was extremely frightening for me. But I remember praying for that opportunity. So, um, I, you know, I jumped off the ledge and, and embraced the dream and, and left the fire department and, and went into the blacklist full time. So what was your first uh, movie? Wow. My first movie, well, it depends on what scale you're talking about, because as newbies, as new actors coming up, the first thing we do is we do a lot of student films. That's yeah. really where you go to get your teeth cut and get experience and, and, and learn a lot. So I did tons of short films. Um, and I really had a great time. A lot of those short films went to Sundance, um, won a lot of awards, went to other film festivals. So I did tons of short films. Um, and it's funny because a lot of short films that I did, a lot of those directors are now going on to do bigger and better things. But I'm proud to say that, I, you know, a lot of NYU, Columbia, I would just look on backstage in the magazines and audition for a lot of those short films. And that's where I got a lot of my experience from. It's funny. You um, you remind me of a friend of mine that I grew up with. He uh hell of an athlete. He ended up going to Cornell to play football. And... Uh, and then he's in movies. He's doing TV. He's doing movies. Uh, his name is Evan Park. I don't know if you heard of him. He uh, he was in Django Unchained. He was in King Kong. And yeah, he was in I know. Evan's my well, I don't know him pers I don't know him personally, but let me tell you a story about Evan Park. I auditioned because I was doing a lot of theater. Mm -hmm. And this, this Evan Park made me do this. So originally in my acting career, I was in love with theater. I was in a comedy troupe. I was in all of these other, other theater companies. I went to Little Rock, Arkansas. I did plays. Like, I just loved theater. And I got to a point where I was like, okay, let me try out now for Broadway. So I go to my first audition, and it wasn't a Broadway play, but it was a, a very big play. Um, and it was about uh, um, Muhammad Ali. And I go to this audition, and the casting director loves me, but then she has me um, audition with everybody who's coming in the room for their different roles 
for this play. So I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I'm having a great time. Now, unfortunately, I didn't get cast, but Evan Park got cast in the role as Muhammad Ali for this play. Um, and I went to go see him, and I was blown away. And that's when I was, wow, like, you have to have, you know, we were moving into the age where theater now, whether it was Broadway or, or one step below Broadway, it was really looking for kind of accomplished actors. Um, mm -hmm. And I had no kind of, uh, I didn't have that type of stuff on my resume. And that's when I shifted from theater, and I was like, okay, if I want to be on Broadway, I need to do TV and film to kind of put a name to myself and then work my way back around to Broadway. So that whole experience auditioning for Muhammad Ali and seeing Evan Park through that work is what inspired me to start taking TV and film classes. Oh, wow. So small, uh, small world, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Evan's, uh, he's, uh, I'll tell you, his nickname was Butter because he was so smooth. You know, so uh, <laughs> and he was one hell of an actor. That's why he got that role. Yeah, what a you know one of the great guys and uh, Long Island guy. So I know him since I'm a kid, and uh, we have some mutual acquaintances. And wow. and you know, I kind of we had a chat because you know he's looking. You know, he's done some three. He's done quite a few big movies, and and what I told him was yeah. you got to stick with that momentum. You know. You got to, obviously, you always want people to want you, but sometimes you have to have people, you have to want them to want you. You know what I mean? Like, stick at it, go after it, get at it, you know. And and, uh, and I think that's what he's doing now. And he's also, I think, involved in production company. Uh, when we uh, go, I'll have to link you two guys up, and I'll uh, tell him the story. He'll, uh, I'm sure he'll appreciate it and get a laugh out of yeah, it. Absolutely. You know, so, um, all right, so now you, you get into movies and then Blacklist. So how does that all come about? So, interestingly enough, as actors, we are always want the big audition. We're like, I need a big audition. If I get a big, if I get a chance to be in front of Spielberg or Spike Lee or, or these big directors, I know that all I need is a chance and I can be a big actor. So we're always mm -hmm. waiting for the big the big audition. And usually for me, when I got big auditions, it came with a lot of anxiety and I usually bombed. <laughs> <laughs> but for Blackness, I'll never forget uh I had an audition and it was on it was about as hot as today, ninety degrees, muggy. It was on a Saturday in July. Now usually for big auditions, you don't have them on the weekend. And for this audition, there was no line. It was improv. So I was like, I'm not doing this audition. It was a hot Saturday, and I got an improv? Like, how big is this role if they don't even have any lines for me? So I was blowing it off, and then at the last minute, like, you know what? Let me go to the audition. So I go to this audition. You know, they had me improv. They had people... The casting director was acting as if she was an FBI director. And they said, hey, we got this character named Red, and you're supposed to be uh, one of his soldiers. And they were trying to get me to turn on Red in the audition. I was like, no, I'm loyal to him. I, you know, my bond is my word. So, was, you know, the audition went well. They called me back, auditioned for the producer. Um, so I went back, auditioned for the producer. That went well. Um, but I really wasn't thinking about the audition because I, I'm a big snowboarder and I had planned a trip to go to Chile to snowboard for two weeks. Mm -hmm. So I was just preparing for my trip and my manager, my agent calls me and they're like, Hey, you know, you booked one episode of this show called the blacklist. And I was like, okay, cool. I booked the episode, this one episode, I'll go do it. So I go to the episode, no lines. And they say, hey, you know what? We want you to do the second episode. And I'm like, well, that's kind of interfering with my snowboarding trip. And my manager was like, well, why don't you go on for two weeks? You can catch the second week. And I was like, well, I got to change my plane ticket. All right, I'll, I'll do that. So after I do the second episode, they say, hey, you know what? We want you to work until December. 
And I'm like, oh, man, I spent $3,500 on this snowboard trip to Chile. Like, uh. and my manager's like, hey, you'll get to go to Chile another time. Don't worry about it. And I was like, okay. And I worked on Blacklist until December. Then they asked me to stay on for the rest of the season as a guest star. Then they called me back the following year as a guest star. And then the third year, they gave me a contract for six years as a series regular. But that is how the whole thing happened. Oh, that's awesome, man. That is awesome. I know uh, yeah. you've got, you know, you're, uh, you've got a, an, an enormous following. And, uh, you know, it's like when we talked about the show, it's like a cult, you know, that everyone watches and everyone knows who everyone is. And, you know, it's uh, it's so impressive. I have to say congratulations. Thank you. you know? it's, 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 it's very interesting because I love to travel and I did end up going to Chile uh, a year or two later to snowboard. And when I went to Chile, there were Dembe fans there. When I went to Morocco, Dembe fans there. When I went to Ghana, Dembe fans there. Spain, Dembe fans there. So it's like this international and national, like, it's just like this cult following that no matter where I've gone, it's like, oh, my God, Dembe. And I'm like, I, I remind myself, I'm humbled, I'm honored. I remember starting off with Instagram, with 400 followers, and now I'm at 250,000. So it's definitely been eye-opening and a humbling experience. So you're definitely now big-time Demby. You know, big-time Demby. (laughs) (laughs) So, wow, that's, uh, I'll tell you that, again, that's so impressive, and, and, and congratulations, and, you know, how many, uh, how many more years uh, do you have le- like? Is the sh- what year are you in now at the show? Is what I meant. That. Yeah. So right. Yeah. So right now we just finished season eight, okay. and we've been green lit for a season nine. So it's like you don't know how much longer it's gonna go. So I just keep counting the blessings and, and take it as it comes. Now, how cool is it working with James Spader? You know, obviously, you know a lot of people know who he is and uh you know it's uh i can remember him forever so how is that yeah and the funny thing is i didn't know who james spader was when i auditioned for the role (laughs) and when i met him i didn't i didn't follow his work which was probably good because that would have brought a whole nother level of anxiety but um i remember my first day meeting him and he was very um was very adamant about getting to know who I was personally. He wanted to know about my personal life, um, where I grew up, where I lived, uh, my thoughts. And we just had this really intense conversation and we just hit it off on the spot. It was just like this chemistry that we both didn't have to work on. And it's, you know, this was my my first series regular role. So working next to this A-list actor um, I've learned so much. I mean, it's just very hard to describe how much I've learned from watching work, but it's definitely been a master class um, working with him these last eight years. And uh, I'm putting all of his techniques and secrets and habits in my pocket to uh, add to my tool list as an actor of, 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 of uh, how I do my work. But it's been great working with them. It's been really great. No, that's great. I mean, obviously, it's a successful show, and uh, everyone's watching it. So I see uh, you're drinking your Arizona iced tea there. You know, I uh, I got my Arizona water here. And, uh, you know, they're, <laughs> they're big supporters of Big Daddy. Uh-huh. And... Uh, you know, uh, some of the other things that I'm involved with, like my golf classic and my youth football camp. Um, if you ever want to coach a football camp, you're more than welcome to come out. We get some big time guys that come out and coach. You want to let's see, we'll get to see if you got 
See if you got any fuel left in the tank, your football uh, mind. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, absolutely, yeah, man. It's uh, we're in a couple of weeks actually, so uh, you know we get some interesting uh, guys come out, coaches, current and retired uh, players, and uh, yeah, we have about fifty, sixty, some sometimes a hundred kids. We had the last uh, we we stopped for because of COVID last year, but. Uh, the lad, the year before, we had about a hundred kids, and uh, and it's funny because we do a three day setup, and we give the kids a training table at night, like if you're at an NFL camp. So I get uh, restaurants to come in, wow. and um, they feed everybody. It's uh, it's fun, and you know the parents jump in, and after the kids eat, and and uh, our fan favorite is Chick Fil A. They come in and. Uh, as they, you know, I'm not, I'm not involved with the uh, on-field stuff, so I'm like the gopher. I go and get everything, set it up and whatnot. And as I'm going to meet Chick-fil-A and everyone sees what's coming out, my brother who coaches with the Bills, he's the one running the camp. And everybody sees that I got Chick-fil-A. And you know they're, like, not paying any attention to him because they're trying to figure out Where's Big Daddy going with that? And when are we getting it? <laughs> you know. So, but uh, but anyway, uh, so let's talk about let's talk about your golf game. You know, we uh, we're honored and privileged that you're coming out to the Big Daddy Celebrity Golf Classic, and uh, you know, uh, we have some interesting guests, and you're one of them. Obviously, some headline. You know, everyone's a headliner. I I never try to put anyone over here or over there everyone's equal and we appreciate everyone giving us their time and and uh so you're uh, bringing your stick out to long island you ready to yeah. hit the ball and uh let it rip yeah well i mean i'm i i guess i'm considered still a newbie i mean for a long time i didn't get you know i remember being you know in the firehouse with guys would change the channel and watch tiger woods and i'm like why are you watching golf? Like, this is so boring. I would walk out the TV room and go find a TV and watch something else. I just didn't get it. And a friend of mine, another firefighter, invited me to his wedding in uh, Punta Cana in Dominican Republic a few years ago. And he's like, why don't you come with me and try this golf thing? I was like, here we go with golf again. And I was like, okay, I'll let me go give it a shot. And the only thing that stood out is I remember going there and they was like, oh, you need a college shirt. I was like, okay, I don't have one. I had to buy a $75 college shirt from the gift shop and put on this shirt. And I go out on the course, and I was just instantly fell in love with the um, architecture, the, the grass, the beauty of it, the calmness of it. I was just in awe of just visually how it looked. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, wow, this is stunning. This is beautiful. This is relaxing. And then uh, I came home from that, and I was like, let me, and I, I said, let me try this again. And I, I remember going to Van Cortland Park, and I was like, ooh, this doesn't look like DR. I thought all golf courses <laughs> look like the one I saw. <laughs> Boom, the yeah, yeah. So yeah. then uh, I found out that no, all, uh, all courses don't look like that. But I still fell in love. I started to slowly fall in love with the game, you know, being an athlete, being competitive. I was like, you know, let me let me try this out. So for a while, I was just whacking at it, whacking at it, whacking at it. And then I went to a golf tournament. I don't know if you know this guy, Wendell Haskins. He has a, a tournament in New Jersey. Uh, yeah, I've heard of him. Golf yeah. Yes, yeah, so I go there and uh, was just blown away at all of these celebrities who were playing golf on an extremely high level. Um, John Starks was there, Doug Williams was there, Anthony Anderson was there. They had all of these people who took it seriously, and you can tell they were playing on a much higher level than me. And I was like, oh, I'm messing around. I think I need to take this a little serious. So then mm -hmm. I went and, and found a coach and started to uh, start my journey of really learning how to play golf the right way and learning the rules and keeping score. So I really would say in the last three to four years, that's when I started taking lessons and really, really um, working 
my game and trying to get it down. And I've just fallen off the cliff in love with it. Not only the sport, but just the amazing people that you meet playing the game from all walks of life. It's just, it's just a, uh, a ocean of resources and good people and information and life lessons. It's just endless uh, amount of uh, learning that can be had from the game and the people that you meet. I'll tell you, that's uh, the first time I ever played golf. I was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I went to the Mario Lemieux Golf Classic, and, you know, he's scratch golfer, you know, and Mr. Hockey and all world in Pittsburgh. Well, I was there as a guest, and the night before they had the big VIP party, and I overdid the drinking part of it. And uh, the next morning, I get a knock on my hotel door saying, hey, Big Daddy, one of the celebrities bailed that you have to fill in. And I was like, what? Fill in? I've never played golf. Let alone that I even have let alone that I even have golf attire. So being as big as I am, what was what was I gonna wear? Like we're out in it was out in Oakmont, which is like they have US opens there. So I end up getting a pair of Zubaz pants. I don't know if you remember what Zubaz was. They uh they were the color short, the pants that they used to have every team logo on them. Uh, uh, and like, if you had a pair of Bengals pants, they would be like the tiger thing on the helmet all the way down, up and down the leg. Well, being in Pittsburgh, I had a pair of Pittsburgh Steelers Zubas and a golf shirt. I didn't have golf uh, shoes. Nice. Right? No, <laughs> golf shoes. no golf shoes. And I, I'm wearing turf shoes. So we go out to play, and I'm hungover. Like, I'm dying. I'm dripping like I was in a shower. So (laughs) as we're, uh, you know, as we're playing, someone's yelling out, Big Daddy, Big Daddy. And I'm like, why is he yelling my name out, you know? So finally, three holes go by, and after hearing, Big Daddy, Big Daddy, turn around, and I go, What? And the guy yells out to me, pick your feet up because you're killing the grind. You're killing the greens <laughs> because I was so tired. I was dragging my feet from walking from the cart to the hole, wherever the ball was. And I happened to be with uh, the owner of some big potato chip company that was based in Pittsburgh. And they had a blast. I had a fun time too, but they were laughing more at me, you know, being uh in the situation that I got put into and being hung over. And just, I was like telling the guy, I told the guy, the caddy, whatever you do, you got to get me a towel. I'm dying. If I hadn't worn a gray shirt, it would have looked like I got dipped in the water. That, <laughs> that's how much I was sweating. And that was my, uh, my first golf experience. And that was like in 1993, I believe. Yeah. 1993 learning how to be and all of Pittsburgh's top elite athletes are there. John Elway, Michael, and then, you know, John Elway was there, Michael Jordan, all these guys. And I'm like, wow, I'm sitting there like, Oh my God, I can't believe uh, all these guys are here. Emmett Smith. And, you know, they're probably wondering that guy must be security or something. (laughs) (laughs) Dressed the way I was dressed. Everybody else is a G'd out, you know, uh, uh, Cartier watch and Nike uh, superstar uh, golf shoes and whatever. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, I look like the equipment manager uh, <laughs> with a stick it with a golf club in his hand. And, and let alone, I didn't even own clubs then. So mm-hmm. I'm using someone else's clubs or rentals, whatever it was. But uh, that was my fondest golf memory because I was uh, – I was thrown to the wolves without even being ready to do it. But uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So, so now as we look look ahead, what are you uh, what else are you thinking? What do you what what's what's another goal that you have? Uh great question. Another goal that I have especially well, I've always I think coming from Harlem, 
um, being able to, to be a Marine and, and work corrections and seeing how so many people from my community uh, didn't make it, didn't have much success. Mm -hmm. um, I've always thought that, hey, I always wanted to create a foundation and give uh, young kids in, in specifically Harlem or all over the city, uh, but from Harlem, but because I'm from Harlem, I say Harlem. I wanted to give them a taste of some of the things I had growing up that helped me um, avoid a lot of the pitfalls and also add it to my success. Um, and when I say success, I'm not really even talking about the blackness. I'm just mean success as far as always having a job, being able to provide for my family, um, have a healthy lifestyle, um, you know, and I'm relatively happy. So that's what I mean when I say success. So I, I remember, I remember in the Marine Corps and I still have the letter. Uh, I had written a letter that I was going to give to Oprah Winfrey and ask her <laughs> to help me get a brownstone in Harlem to help uh, cater to veterans. Cause this is when I came back from Kuwait and desert storm. Um, so I have been thinking about this way for so long and I, it's still on my mind, still heavy. So the next thing I would love to do is to create a foundation um, and in some way give back in a way where kids coming up can experience some of the things I did, whether it's, uh, you know, the Boy Scouts isn't really uh, as popular as it was when I was growing up, but in introduce them to the outdoors, to swimming, to rowing. Um, to canoeing, to uh, learning certain life skills like swimming or not tying or starting a fire, lighting a campfire, um, learning. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge advocate for everybody taking civil service exams, whether it's police, fire, sanitation, corrections. As you can see from my life, I was able to switch gears so a lot because I was prepared and I had taken exams that gave me choices to say, hey, if I don't like this, I can switch to that. Um, so my goal is just to, to create some type of foundation and give back through a lot of the things that I love, whether it's snowboarding, whether it's golf, whether it's swimming, whether it's, you know, outdoor activities, whether it's camping, um, and just give back to these kids so that they also can have um, a leg up and have some of the opportunities that are not provided to them especially due to financial reasons uh, or having positive role models in their life. <laughs>